thank you all for, for being with us today. And uh, thank you up here. And thank Mike. Um, what? And thank, oh, absolutely thank Cantor Film Center and all the people up there. Uh, and Mark, too, and, and Stephanie. Um, I thought this was a good opportunity here at the end to, to just kind of bring thoughts together. But but eventually, I want to start talking, and I want to start talking with all of you about, about short of the corn thresher, or maybe for those of us who won't be able to get a corn thresher, what, what a good death might be within the system, or even if we're, what would it would take to change the system. But Sam, you, you had some stuff that you wanted to talk about first. And yeah. Maybe we can... um, thank you. Hi. So I wanted to, again, thank um, Ren especially for putting this together and for his time that he spent with us. Um, but I, I wanted to also talk a little bit from the perspective of, of where I'm coming from, as I mentioned earlier, I'm, I'm the assistant director of a research institute here at NYU uh, called the Institute for Public Knowledge. And uh, at our institute, we're looking more and more at factors that, that strengthen and weaken social cohesion, um, which is to say we're asking the questions about what make communities come together in different situations or not. Uh, or not come together, um, but they tend to especially come together in times of crisis. Um, and I do, like many of you here, uh, especially for the morning session with Diane and Liz, um, it gives me anxiety to hear, you know, facts and figures and comments and, you know, anecdotes about, uh, you know, moments where our fellow Americans don't feel that we have some kind of commonwealth, that we have something that we share. Um, that we have a stake in this world together. Um, and I just want to highlight that the very early, very preliminary findings of work that we're doing on Superstorm Sandy um, around communities and what we've seen in our own anecdotes from more Oklahoma and places like this, it's, it's clear that we, we do have a desire, at least in certain kinds of situations, to help each other out in profound ways. Um, and it's just that we don't look at all issues and all people in the same way. We don't look at suffering or the, the suffering of any individual, indi any individual in the same way, irregardless of the circumstances that brought them to that point of suffering. Or in the case of what we're talking about today, that point of death. And I want you just to consider the, the way that we look at day-to-day -day gun violence um, a sickeningly banal phrasing of moments of individual suffering and tragedy versus the way we look collectively at school shootings or other mass atrocities. We have different ways of processing this information. Um, and, I, and I bring this up because I want to introduce the idea that how we talk about phenomena matters a great deal. Um, what we pay attention to matters a great deal. And of course, that the exceptional moments of suffering, which get the vast bulk of our attention and resources from a political perspective, they overshadow the constant to become acclimatized, or I should say that they overshadow the constant grinding tragedies that are occurring hourly, daily, yearly. Um, and I believe that this kind of consciousness is part of the human condition. That to become acclimatized to the systems in which we're embedded and to jump up in moments of exception. This is part of how we survive in a very complex world. But I think if we're clever and we're thoughtful and we're strategic, there are things we can do to bring more attention to the moments of individual suffering and the system that is currently set up to create these moments of suffering. So I just wanted to react that way. I guess, I mean, for me, how this began, uh, began in various ways, but, but one of the things I think about a lot, and it was, all, it was suggested by somebody in the audience, uh, a few years ago, I had, we had to put my, uh, our dog down, is not a phrase. Uh, but it was the most amazing, I mean, yeah, he, he, it, it was 
he had a cancer that was growing in his hind legs and it was forcing it out and he was obviously in terrible pain and, and more and more pain and, and so forth. And so we took it him to the vet and the vet said, well, I guess it's the time. And, and there were these two amazing shots. You know, one shot knocked him out and the next shot a minute later stilled his heart. And I think somebody made this comment in the audience earlier. We call that humane. Oh, that's a very humane way of doing it. Something that we would never do for human beings. And yet it seems to me that, that at one level, when I think about for myself what a good death would be, um, I would like to, and this is, this is uh, I, I would like to think this is a little bit along, along the notions of the knowing about your stroke 10 minutes before you have it, but, but there will come a point, I imagine, in my life where, where things, I, I, unless, unless I die suddenly and, or, you know, hit by a car or something, but where, where um, it'll be time. And uh, you know, I, there, I, I, I would hope that it's well on this side of being completely demented or completely, you know, kidney dialysis, whatever, whatever the kind of thing would be. But there'd be a sense that I've lived a full life, and that from here on in, I don't really, either myself or, or in terms of my family, drag everybody through more. And my fantasy is that that I, I just think that that we always hold awake on the wrong side of death. You know, I want to have a wake and go to my wake, you know. I want to invite all my friends and, and have just a fan, you know, great party. And, 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 uh, uh, and it, it'll be known that this is, you know, he, Ren is beginning to get sick and, or, you know, it's well on his way and, and it's time and we're going to have a great party. And then they'll go away and then you know, my more intimate family will be together for another few days. And then at a certain point, I get the two pills, you know. And I don't know why... That is such an impossible thing to imagine. Um, so, and, and I do think that that, in terms of a lot of the stuff that got talked about today, that that's a, that's a and, and I, I, by the way, don't think that I'm that that original in that fantasy. I think a lot of us have. If you were to press us, that's kind of what we think would be a good way of doing it. Um, so maybe I'd start with, with laying that out as a possibility and get your responses to that in terms of whether a that makes sense to you and b whether you, it could ever happen. <laughs> Uh, and, and then beyond that, uh, at a certain point, we want to open up to you and talk about some of your feelings about it. Well, it <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, it, it's, it's not a fantasy. It's, it's a reality, and it's not a new reality, um, even here in the United States. So one comment that was made on my article was uh, by a family member, a daughter of a physician, and this must have been 40 years ago, I'm guessing, when this all happened. When her dad died, one, and she, apparently they lived in a relatively rural area. It turned out that she came to find out that her father had a pact with the other physicians in the area. And if something terrible happened, they had a kit which they would use either on themselves or with one of their fellows to take care of the problem. She found out about this after her father died and one of the other physicians came to pick up the kit. And so I, I think if we go back to the Marcus Welby era of medicine, we're in the house era of medicine now, God help us. Uh, <laughs> and it, it, it does. And that article? I'm sorry. Have you written that article? That's I have not yet, but but it's but it's absolutely true because what that represents is is the embracing of technology and the discarding of humanity which those two models represent. And and those of us who have lived to the through the two eras, we all know which we prefer. So uh, so what you're talking about as a fantasy is, is not. Now, I've been asking this question for quite some time, and uh, there's kind of a new answer that's emerged, uh, and there's literature that's been written on this exact question. What do people want in a good death? They want to, 
die at home. They want their family around. They want to trust their caregivers. There's a whole list. But there's a new one that's emerged that I hadn't heard before. And that is that people want to die with their pets. Now, you say it, and it's like, of course. <laughs> that makes perfect sense. Um, and I, I, I certainly can embrace that on a personal level. Um, but it's, it's not been a traditional uh, model. And of course, you know, what are the chances of that happening in a hospital? Zero. But I was having a conversation just this last week with a psychologist friend of, a friend of mine who, who works with uh, end-of-life issues. And he says, well, you know, that's really true, but the pet doesn't have to be alive. So you can use stuffed animals, and you, and you can replicate the experience for the patient in a lot of ways. Now, this... This, to me, is a conceptually very interesting and innovative, you know? And so now I looked, looked it up, and I find there are hospitals where, where they do this. It's been true for a long time in children's hospitals. They give stuffed animals to, to uh, children. But uh, there are places where they've now discovered that demented patients, elderly um, uh, patients who, who don't have control of their mental faculties, they'll give them a stuffed animal, and... They, they are tremendously soothed by that. They may, have to, they may be able to completely avoid chemical sedation. It completely changes the experience. So I think it's these innovative possibilities that present themselves that can tremendously enhance our personal experiences. I want to see the proposal in the National Institute for Health about dolls for, for, for <laughs> more patients. But did you have any thoughts yet? Or, or uh, you, 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 okay, you'll wait a, <laughs> wait, wait a bit. I should, by the way, mention the, the, the dark side of my fantasy is, is uh, since we are a humanities institute and we do want to give you some education in humanities, quote unquote, besides medicine, is the death of Petronius. Do you know about, about that? Petronius is the guy who wrote the Satyricon. And in his day job, he, he uh, was the arbiter of games for Nero, which meant that he had to come up with a different orgy every, every Saturday night, basically. Um, and, you know, some more and more amazing, demented, debauched orgy in each one. And at a certain point, he was just bored out of his mind doing this. And so he decided he was going to have the all-time great uh, event this coming Saturday, and when people arrived, it was completely empty, except for a bathtub in the middle of the room, uh, with warm water and with him in it. And he slit his his wrists, and put them in the water. And people would come up to him, and if he wanted to talk to them, he'd wrap his wrists for a little while and talk to them. And then when he was bored, he'd unwrap them and put them back in. And then other people would come up, and he wouldn't even take his wrists out of the water. Did like you know, I, performance art. Uh, I, yeah, I, I would rather be dead than talking to you. I mean, but. Uh, <laughs> So, so for those of you who, who want to take a more demented view of my fantasy, there's that. <laughs> what about you? What are, what are some of your thoughts from the rest of the, rest, rest of the day and, and thoughts about uh, how, how either for yourself? Let's, let's go over there for starters. Uh, like to give a wait, 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 wait. We got a mic. We got to give you a mic. <laughs> Stephanie? Yeah, let me see. I'd like to give a plug for uh, family caregivers because there was a bit mentioned about um, end of life, you know, people swooping in at the last minute and feeling guilty and all of that, but there wasn't much about the people who are there day in, day out for weeks, months, years, decades sometimes now. Um, and I think it's a really important piece because it just it goes hand in hand. When there's a patient, there's almost always somebody there. Um, but my grandmother, I took care of her, and she died at 102 in the house that she was born in. And, you know, it's what you're saying about the pets, I mean, I, it's, it's almost the comfort of having something there, right? And um, just as she was dying, I ended up getting into the bed with her because I didn't really know what to do. And I called her doctor, and he said, just be with her. I said, what, you know, I'm not sure what's going on. And it was the best advice um, you know, that I could have been given, but she calmed down as soon as I was there. And I really believe that it's, so that's very similar, right? Um, we don't often get into bed with people when they're dying, I don't think, but same kind of, kind of idea. Um, but 
her death was so good, really. I mean, I was there with her. Her great-grandson was there with her, uh, her other daughter, um, because I kept the medical system away from her and her away from it. And that's huge. And I think it really, you know, I don't know what to do with that, but um, she would not have died so well if other people had been involved. Well, one of, w that's a really important lesson is staying out of the medical system because it's, it's once you're in it, it's self-perpetuating and it's driven with tremendous force. Um, and a person who, who is terminal, um, I think that's just one of the critical things is, 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 is to stay out of it. Now, it used to be you'd have to fight this battle by yourself. Um, but we now have uh, experts in hospice and palliative care and I'm, I'm happy to say um, an increasing number of physicians in, in, in practice of various sorts that are sensitive to these issues. Uh, I always thought that one of my jobs as a family practitioner was to protect my patients from the specialists. And, uh, <laughs> and I, I still think that's true. So you're the gatekeeper, but you keep the gate closed. <laughs> <laughs> you, you got it. Um, <laughs> But, but for the opposite reasons for what people think. Uh, so, so that's very important because you'll read stories all the time, a, a tremendous uh, amount of literature and narrative in um, the bioethics literature about people taking just the slightest step into the system. Well, I know she didn't want drugs and IVs, but you know, she's just got a little infection. If we just give her, you know, bring her into the hospital and just give her some IVs and some antibiotics for just a few days, you know, she'll perk right up. And, and that begins the unstoppable odyssey that leads to procedures and all kinds of things that are just un unbelievable. The medical web is what my grandmother called it. Yeah. And she spent her whole life staying out of it. Is that the thresher? Yeah, <laughs> it, it, it is. It's well described. Other comments? Let's see over here. Uh, my mother's 98. She's out shopping. You know, she should be back in about 20. I'm not kidding. She is. Right, that's good. But I'm interested in what happened to her sister. Her sister was about 85, slowing down. And they said, well, you know, this little operation will give you better blood flow, a little bit of what they call a bypass, but a lot of it. And they're talking her into this. And I, I said, gee, that's an age. Why, why do an operation? But she wants to live a better life, a, a more vigorous life. So the operation goes well, and she dies the next day in the, while she's in the hospital of a stroke. So, and they're asking my mother, hey, why don't we do a little operation? I mean, 98, let, let's get away from this. Why don't we do an operation or a procedure? Because it might make you feel more vigorous. I mean, there is a fantasy going on in the minds of I don't know, maybe it's corporate behind some of these doctors, but why would you even cons consider that? Or maybe I'm behind times, and you have to think of people in the 100 range now that, that deserve a vigorous life with a little risk thrown in. I mean, it really confuses me. I'll, 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 uh, I'll speak to that. I mean, I think I come back to my, you know, my finding of the line, and we don't know uh, where it is, and doctors are supposed to help we think, identify where it is and when it should not be crossed or how we should attempt to cross it. But the issue, I mean, I've talked to so many physicians now about, these about the age going up for procedures and the fact that procedures, as they get less invasive to do, laparoscopically, et cetera, et cetera, become safer and the age is going up. So what happens is physicians get acculturated, socialized, to doing it. So I heard, for example, a lot of cardiologists say, you know, when I was in training, we never put in a defibrillator. We never did bypass on somebody over 70. But now I don't blink and I'll consider and speak to somebody about doing it at age 85, 87, 89. Because, you know, these things, it, it's so complicated because the results are often good. Giving people a more vigorous life for however many years they have. But it's this problem of knowing in advance when, who, who it'll be good for and to what extent, and we don't know. And this is why it's so hard to say no, because we want to hope that it will, it will be good. And um, Mike, I want to thank you specifically for your 
uh, hard work in your monologue. I mean, I think you um, were incredibly thoughtful, and uh, I think everybody here really appreciated what you had to say. And you absolutely echoed what Diane Meyer, who runs palliative care at Mount Sinai, said this morning. I'm not sure everybody was to hear, where she said the system is absolutely set up to do exactly what it is supposed to, what, what it's doing today, and so it's successful in that sense. And it brings in the specialists, it rewards financially everybody who's in the system, the insurance people, the pharma companies who do the research, et cetera. It's working in the way that it was designed to work. So in order to answer the question, how do we have a good death, ultimately, it really is about changing the system for everybody. In the meantime, people can try to, if, if, as long as people as we've all gathered today, greater understanding about how the system works, people can um, hopefully help design a death for themselves, or I think everybody in this room is probably for a family member, that tries to circumvent some of the just um, standard of care practices that, that go on. And I, at the moment, that and you know the grassroots revolutionary efforts to change the practice through uh, legislation and, 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 and politics is what we can work on right now. I'll see right there. Hello, sir. Um, my name is Jeffrey Smith. I got a call from an editor down in Washington about this meeting. Uh, he was with the American Free Press down in Washington. I'm very, very glad that he told me about this. It's been very, well, illuminating listening to the various viewpoints here. But there are aspects of, of, of this whole thing, which I don't think you're touching on, that are very, very important that I see every day. For example, <clears throat> if you want to know what's driving a lot of these care institutions, hospitals, whatever, it's the amount of debt load they're under. How big a note did they sign to get those improvements or build that building? They have to fill those damn beds. Otherwise, the banks are in trouble. The banking community, the financial community that has laid out the money for these huge institutions is the great beneficiary in this. That's not being mentioned here because a lot of people can't think past the corporate thing. There is a huge, far more important entity beyond that that is actually driving this. Secondly, as far as the shaping of medicine as it appears to the, you know, my mom just died. She was 103, okay? And thank God, you know, and she was healthy to the day she died. Uh, but one of the things she said was it's because she was never tampered with. Smart lady, okay? First of all, however, time and time again, I have spoken to longevity researchers or people that are seeking to keep people healthy. And they all say there's two things. First of all, it's the funding wars that goes on. Who's, who gets funding for what research? Look, you've got a funding system now where there are two sources, the government and tax-free foundations. And every foundation president knows what happens if, you know, he doesn't want that call from IRS, does he? Sure he doesn't. Say so, they you know, on there is a great shaping of where money goes to. Mm -hmm. That's very, very important how it affects the elderly. And it's also something else. In the NGO world, there is a mantra that's been, since I was a kid, that the world is overpopulated. That's a kind of a poisonous element that has gone all through the funding and all through the thinking towards the elderly, okay? There are, that's generated a very, unseen but very powerful entity here. So these are all things that I don't think have been touched on here, which, which I tell you I see almost every day in my writing. Uh, so this is, the, the, these are all forces that are very powerful. But the other thing is, think about this. One, one how, more thing. Other one more thing. Yeah. How many elderly people and how many people generally have left the pharmaceutical system because they found alternatives, okay? Mm -hmm. Hundreds of thousands, certainly. And the thing, because how many people are killed by pharmaceuticals? And the thing is what? Now, you've got, you've got a deal where they're gonna be forced back into pharmaceuticals by codex. Google codex, see what's going on. I mean, what's going on here? How can this be? These are all the forces that are very, very powerful, 
and I don't think you've touched on. Thank, thank you very thank you. much for your time, okay, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, a general comment I would make is that some of them, uh, this has been a whole series of things we've been doing certainly over the last 12 years, and some of them, the banking system, for example, we've talked about in other places, and I do see them all fitting together, and I agree with you in, in much of what you said. Uh, other comments, let's see. Y you first, and then you, so. Hi. Wait, wait till we're, we, we, we wait. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Um, thanks for this. It's really great. Um, my name's Anna. I'm a, I'm a registered nurse. I work in emergency department, and um, I also am an elementary school nurse. Sorry, I wasn't really using the mic. Um, just to give you my perspective, I'm, you know, I'm a healthcare provider. I'm a divorced mother, I'm a dedicated daughter, my parents live in another city, my grandmother, who's 100, which, as we're learning, is oh, not God. too unique now. Oh, she just turned 101, I well, Just out of curiosity, how many people in this room have, have family members who are over 100? I'm just curious. God, look at this, isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. Wow, okay, go ahead. So I, anyways, so much to say, but I, the, I think the only unique perspective that I can offer the conversation is the experience that I have working as an individual healthcare provider in these situations over and over and over again. Um, obviously, in the emergency department, it's down to the wire, right? So there, the people come in without advance directives, and the conversations have to happen, and they often have to happen quickly. Language so is so important. And I'm even talking, it, take away anybody whose English has a second language, because that's a whole extra layer of practice. But there's um, so much that we can say, if you say, do not resuscitate, then people say, well, don't. Resuscitate sounds great. Don't do not that, do it. Mm -hmm. and, and then, but if you say comfort measures only, that sounds a little better. And then if you, sometimes I've had a chance, so you don't, I get very busy, as you imagine, but sometimes you have a chance to have a conversation, a humane conversation with a family member, and sometimes a patient, if they're conscious enough, to, um, to explain you know, what it means, what those antibiotics, that round of antibiotics would mean, or what hydration even would mean for the patient, what a, a feeding tube would mean. People don't know. And it's just a matter of language and taking the time to talk to people. So I'm getting a little nervous talking about all this stuff, so I'm going to stop. You're, you're, but, doing, um, you're doing great, by the I, way. I just wanted to add the um, healthcare bedside perspective. Thank no, you. you're, you're absolutely right. Um, the emergency room is absolutely the worst possible place to be holding these conversations. And unfortunately, it's where a lot of them have to be held because there wasn't something done in advance. And when the patient's there in the emergency room, you've got to deal with. You've got to deal with what's in front of you. Um, but your description of uh, how you frame things, I think is critically important. And, and having great skills in doing that are, are critical. Uh, so. Um, what we talk about in terms of no code or no CPR uh, types of orders. Um, there's a movement now that's being done in a bunch of hospitals to replace that verbiage with an order that says, allow natural death. And that has a completely different flavor to it. Mm -hmm. And people can, can listen to that and think about that. Well, you know, natural. That's a good thing, <laughs> without chemicals. <laughs> Allows uh, right. a good and then you thing get too. to actually have the conversation about well, be with be with her, mm -hmm. right? Or or d d really co coach somebody about how to help their family member through a natural death, even it, whether it's going to happen right there in ten minutes or it's going they're going to be discharged. And it's going to happen within you don't know twenty four to mm -hmm. six weeks. Or, you know, it, you just but you can have that conversation once you get past that first. Well, I asked before about how many people have people who are 100. How many nurses here? Uh, I don't know whether, how, how many of you were here earlier today, but I just, I think a round of applause for the nurses. for what <laughs> Bren, I, I also, I just want to highlight that um, there are lots of 
very intelligent, very dedicated people who are working around this, this question of how to have that conversation, where to have that conversation. And there are very good projects going on about that. And if you are interested in learning about that, there is the, the, the Conversation Project, which is a, a great uh, resource if you do want to have this conversation with someone in your life or if you want to think about it. Can you describe what that is? Um, it's, I, I believe, I, I, I know a little bit about it, but I mean, the, the, it, you can request, I believe, a kit, you know, where the, they will, the, the organization will send you um, a package that you can look at and with the, all the materials, lays out a lot of the facts, some of the legal forms that you might want to use or at least advice about how to use it. Um, and, it, and it gives you advice on how to structure this conversation with members of your family. And there's videos. And well, there's well, there's there's also bedside videos mm -hmm. that um, I don't know if you get. There was an article in the Atlantic that brought this to my attention, which we sort of circulated around. But uh, a, a medical doctor named Angelo Valendes is that? Do you guys know? Um, went about putting together the most. Um, uh, he, he, his, his goal was to create videos that would explain with the least amount of bias about what these procedures would entail. Um, and so, for instance, we were talking earlier about cardiopulmonary respiration, you know, uh, or resuscitation. And so it says, well, what is CPR? And, it, and it's a three-minute video, and it's designed, uh, and it, we worked with psychologists for this, but it was designed to not uh, create bias in, in the viewer uh, and just show what these um, procedures entailed and what, what, what it would do to your body to undergo these different things. And there's, there's ones that are designed to have to facilitate the conversation before the thing takes place. And there's also ones that are designed to spell out the procedure right at the bedside that, that they have to make a critical choice. And so rather than talking to the doctor and then having the nurse interpret the doctor and then talking to another specialist, the idea is to show a video that will say, this is what it will look like, this is what it will mean, this is what's likely with the best possible facts that we have. Um, and, and it was shown in studies that, um, that these videos did lead to uh, what I would think would what I personally feel like are better decisions in terms of um, uh, the, the possible health outcomes as a result of that. But, um, but yeah, I don't know if you guys have other thoughts on that. Well, just a, an example of, of the types of, of things that uh, are used now mm -hmm. in these toolkits kind of relates back to identifying what a good death is. And this is one of the problems you run into is the uh, discordance between a, what a patient thinks and what the family thinks they think. And so I was introduced recently to a deck of cards that's designed for this purpose. And it, it's you split it into two. It's identical. And each card has on it um, values of, of various sorts. And so what you, the patient, do and you, the family member, do is you take uh, your deck, your half of the deck, and you pull out the 10 things that you think are the most important to the patient. And you both do them. And then you compare them. Right. And apparently, this is a very useful tool uh, in, the, in the hospice world. They're finding hmm. it's very useful for initiating. What are some examples of the de deck of cards, just words on the deck? Well, the, the things like, um, I want to die at home. I want to die with my pet present. It, things like right, that, yeah. mm -hmm. and there's there's you know like twenty of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's see. I had said that he, he was next, yeah, and that, and then we're going to come so, to you. Yeah. Um, there's two things. First of all, I want to congratulate the people who put this together. That you have been able to retain all these people since eleven o'clock this morning. It is truly a testament to the. Uh, the, 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 the quality of the planning and the uh, quality of the facilitators and the presenters and, and everything. It's really an excellent job. Um, uh, uh, secondly, um, uh, um, um, when I think of uh, a good death, I think of the way Nelson Rockefeller died. Uh, he was in <laughs> bed with his mistress. He was about to climax and he had a heart attack. I mean, you can't beat that. Um, <laughs> Uh, or James Cagney, you know, he was living on his uh, beautiful farm up in uh, upstate New York someplace and um, uh, had a uh, complete dinner, sat back in his chair, took an inhale, then he closed his eyes and that was that. You know, it, it's as peaceful as it can, can be. Uh, I, with a little bit of luck, maybe I'll die that way. 
uh, uh, Rockefeller's way. Um, <laughs> the, um, there was, I mean, the joke there famously, there was a famous, I don't know, I'm not going to say it. Right. Oh, okay. Um, uh, you, 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 uh, can but, all, you can all figure it out yourself, but it was the headline. Anyway, but but and, 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 and looking at the future, in addition to paddling my kayak out under the Verrazano Bridge, um, there, there are other possibilities. I think people die as well as they live. If people live uh, happy, uh, positive lives, and uh, you know they're surrounded with friends and family and all of that, their chances of dying well are really high. Um, if people live isolated, lonely, uh, embittered lives, um, you know, filled with uh, tension and failure and all that, um, the like chances of their dying pretty <laughs> miserably are, are, are pretty good as well. And so, you know, I think it's we, we need to focus on on and how to do that, how to live well. Um, and the third thing, um, I think, is that uh, there are ways that one can facilitate that. You know, as I, as I think about how I'm going to go uh, uh, as I get older, uh, and hopefully still reasonably healthy, um, I, I think I might join a, a Buddhist retreat center. I, I, it was one that I go to in West Virginia. Um, uh, and, and, you know, I think uh, dying, sitting in meditation would be a great way to go. Uh, and, and I'd be surrounded by, by very like-minded people, and, and uh, um, uh, it, would be a, it would be a very peaceful way. And, and, you know, I think there are ways to plan for that kind of thing. Um, uh, but, uh, but, but I think uh, people have to have purpose, and I think one can, it's possible to die purposefully the same way that you live purposefully. Mm -hmm. And, and, the, and the more that we're able to do that, the more we give intentional thought to that, uh, I think the more likely we are to be successful. If, if we just end up being old people staring out the window mindlessly, um, then death is going to come very badly. Hmm. Thank you. Um, um, Megan Marshak was the name of the woman with uh, Rockefeller. And <laughs> And the great, Please, people. And the, great, <laughs> and the great mystery that occurred was when he died, she kind of disappeared for about a week. And nobody could find her anywhere in America. And not many people knew that she had a brother who was a medical student. In fact, he happened to be a student in my class <laughs> at Davis. And so two days after the whole headline thing hit, there's this woman sitting in our classroom. And it was Megan Marshak sitting with her brother and was there for several days. So now you all know. <laughs> Wait, d d does that mean that, that you killed Rockefeller? <laughs> uh, let's see, where are you? Over here. <laughs> um. Unfortunately, we don't usually get to choose how we die. Uh, we can't forget that. Um, but that's not what I want to talk about. Uh, in addition, well, first I should say that. Um, is it work? Close is it? Yeah. Is this? OK. Nine years ago, my husband had a traumatic brain injury, which left him uh, like somebody with advanced Alzheimer's. For the first six years, I took care of him myself. For the last three years, he's had 24-7 care as he has deteriorated, the way people with um, degenerative brain disease do. Uh, and um, he's wonderful. Other people wouldn't recognize that, but I do. Uh, my, one of my great purposes is to keep him out of the hospital, and it is very difficult. Um, we have all of those papers. He had fortunately, oh, I should say that when he was in the emergency room uh, or the trauma center after his accident, uh, the doctor, he had broken all his ribs and his feet and punctured both lungs. I mean, he was a wreck, but he had multiple clots on his brain. And the doctor, the head of the trauma unit, asked him if he would want to be kept alive if they uh, felt that he wouldn't be able to re be returned to a normal, independent life. And he said, no, no. And he repeated it. But here we are nine years later, and um, he's with us. Uh, and I, I, I'm not 
complaining about that. I think actually his life is kind of happy. Um, he, uh, but repeatedly he has almost fallen into the hands of the hospitals. Now, in addition to the advanced directives, there's something called a non-hospital DNR, do not resuscitate, which um, I keep with me always. I keep all of the advanced directives in my purse for both him and for me. <clears throat> but this, this is written by a doctor and should serve to prevent 911 callers on the street, say. That's my great terror, that he'll be out with his caregiver, he'll fall. Some, uh, his caregivers are completely um, in tune with our plans, but some passerby, somebody on the street will call 911, and that will be the end of him. Um, it's well known that people with dementia who go into a hospital, even very briefly, wind up two stages worse permanently. You're nodding. You know this. People don't know this. Uh, it's the worst thing in the world to take a person with dementia into a hospital. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, once when he was, uh, several years ago when he was in a violent stage, the um, police came to our apartment and even though I'm his spouse, they were, they insisted on taking him to a psych ward. Well, I was able to stop them. I won't tell you how, but that is always... <laughs> That's better than the headline. How did you... <laughs> <laughs> it's a great danger. Well, I called my son. My son came and was also forceful. And then one of the police people, a woman, came back to the door and said, don't ever say that there was violence or they will take him away, say he had heart palpitations. And so, there, I mean, there were many, many tricks hmm. for, but. That's a metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, but my point is that no matter what plans you have, it's not so easy. It's like a full-time job of vigilance to carry out those plans. And these fantasies about what a good death looks like are just that. You don't have control. There are um, something like, I've forgotten how many million, many millions of people in this country who are, have um, dementia and who are cared for by family caregivers, uh, <clears throat> and they are the ones who are going to do a lot of the decision making about death and end of life. It's not, we've spent the whole day talking as if it's the patients who are going to decide. It's not likely to be the patients who will decide. Mm -hmm. I guess I could go on forever, but I'll stop there. Thank you. Let's see here. Uh, yeah, let's go to Ben first, and then. I had one, one little thing to say about and language. I'll go back there. I don't know whether anybody said it, but there was the, in the elections, you know, there was this discussion of the death panels, mm -hmm. which was somehow the most horrible, frightening thing that we didn't even know what it is. And you guys are the death panel. <laughs> what a wonderful <laughs> thing. That's what we need more of. And it's <laughs> also the audience. That's exactly what we need is one solution anyway is yeah. well i was going to say in, in, partly in response to you that uh, that that although it is true that everything you said is true it is also true that one can imagine the country being more sensitized through conversations like this and, and that and that you know uh i had originally uh had this idea that that we should have that there should be a day set aside that, 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 would be, that would get the same kind of coverage as Mother's Day or Father's Day or something. And my original idea was you don't want to do it every year because it's just too depressing, but, but maybe like every four years. And I thought, so should we do it on the Olympics and now uh, the election day? And, uh, and I thought February 29th would be a great day. <laughs> that, that, that would be. But then it turned out I found out that somebody else has already come up with a day, and it's April. What is the date? April 16th, National Healthcare Decisions Day. April 16th. April 16th, the day after taxes, you're supposed to have this conversation. But in any case, if somebody, uh, but I mean, it really, if it would be talked about, it would show up on the Today Show, it would show up in, you know, and, and, and New York Magazine would have it on its cut, whatever. I mean, however we do things in this crazy country, uh, all the books on the subject would come out that day, so all the people would be on their book tours that day, and, you know, but, but I don't know. But, 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 but I d it does seem to me that having this kind of conversation would, would be useful. Okay, let's well, see. Who, well, I think there's, there's, the a demand. The there's a demand for this. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and it, it, just to give you an example, I was sitting in Los Angeles three days or four days ago, and I happened to read an uh, op-ed in the New York Times by Danielle Offsey, a physician, an N NYU physician. Uh, and she is writing about medical mistakes, mm -hmm, yeah. which is an interesting enough article. But when you looked at the comments, it, people can um, like a comment. They can mark it as they liked it. And so the next to highest one had something like 24 likes. The one that had 150 likes was the one, because she describes her own mistake, where she had an 80-some-odd-year-old person who came into the emergency room. They were demented from a uh, nursing home. And she kind of just blew them off. And it turns out they had a bleed in their head. And the radiologist uh, picked it up. And so off to neurosurgery they went and uh, got a procedure to remove a blood clot. And the comment that was so liked by so many people was, what the hell are they doing a neurosurgical procedure on a, a demented 88-year-old person in a nursing home who doesn't know what's going on and is completely disoriented. And there's pros and cons to that, and there was quite a bit of argument about it, but that was the comment that everybody picked up on and they wanted to talk about, although that was not the primary subject of mm -hmm. the article. Mm -hmm. And so I just feel a pressure out there, and I feel a pressure from those people who are speaking that they want to talk about this. And this is a real change in our culture. Hmm. Let's see, over there, you got the phone. Yeah, yeah so uh, your original question was, uh, how could I imagine my death? And I guess... Or uh, a good death. Good death, thanks. So at this age, it would have to involve some amount of heroic self-sacrifice. Mm -hmm. It would have hmm. to be a trading of my life for another person's life. If I got to a point where physically that wasn't uh, available to me, or let's say I was charged with protecting other people's lives for a number of years, children, uh, then uh, I think that I would have to have a pact with someone uh, where we would kill each other. And it, and it disturbs me that that's still so illegal, you know, so many years after Kevorkian being put away. Uh, thank you. Uh, and if I have a little time, I would like to cede it to this woman, and I would like to ask her now that it's your job in a way to, to imagine a perfect death for your husband. Do you have one? Let's give it back to you. Over here. <laughs> perfect, probably not, but... <laughs> Yes, well, it's the same that I imagine as the perfect death for so many of us. He will die in his sleep, um, happily or peacefully, preferably after the day after um, we have taken a Cesaride to Chinatown for his favorite meal, and he'll be full, and um, he won't wake up. It, it's the same. I mean, and I would like the same thing. But actually, what you said about making a sacrifice, that's what I really want for myself. I had forgotten that that was always my goal. Either that or go down, as so many in the 19th century did, saying, vive l'anarchy. <laughs> 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 Maybe on the scaffold. <laughs> Let's take the person behind you and then... We'll I'm right move. here, so I'll take the mic. We lived in London for eight years, and I had my children there. The way they dealt with children was you saw whatever doctor could see you, babies who were born with mouth, all sorts of... They, were not allowed, they, they made no heroic efforts. They treated death the same way. They, in a way, had death panels. The National Health Service would not prolong your life if enough doctors said... You'll be a vegetable, you'll be a this, you'll be a that. And um, it was accepted. People were brought up knowing malformed babies would not be saved, with no brains, with no... And people who probably had no hope of living but would drain resources for the young people who got sick, there would be resources from them. It wasn't so horrible, but they would call it a death panel here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's go back to the woman in the yellow over there. While it's going over there, I mean, it, just to... to 
as I've told you, I love contradicting myself and, and contradicting you too, for that matter. Uh, I mean, I, I have a very dear friend who uh, was born with spinal bifida, and uh, uh, she wasn't, and she wasn't supposed to live, and and, and uh, they did some extraordinary operation on her, uh, and she's now 50. She is far. She's an incredible. Well, actually, she's the artist who did that drawing of me on the back of the of uh, of that brochure, and and um, the, on the blue brochure, the blue brochure about yeah that thing. But but anyway, but but the point is she. Uh, you know that one one has that problem too. I, 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 in a certain sense, I guess the thing that becomes interesting in this thing is that all these things should, at least they should be talked about. They should be you know subject for discussion. What do we mean by five doctors saying doesn't have a chance? Well, maybe you know it's it's, it's hard. But but anyway, my husband and I both have advanced directives written. Called, about hold it to your dozen, hold it to your mouth. About a dozen years ago. Close okay. It. Yeah. Now now when you do that, Kate. Okay. And anyhow, you both had advanced directives yes. about a dozen years we ago. We have them in the car. We have them in the house. My daughter knows where they are. However, if we had an accident, and we were in a car or any place else, and we would be taken immediate, immediately to the emergency room, nobody knows we have a, an advanced directive. They resuscitate us if they can or do all sorts of heroic things. In the meantime, I think there's a more simple thing to do. Once you get past 80 or 85, whatever the, your good number is, if you have a kind of advanced directive, why not get a tattoo on the front with a DNR on it? So if you got taken to the emergency room or any kind of a, a, a situation where they need to do life preserving, enhancing uh, things to you, they would see it immediately. This is not a person to, to mess with. We, we talked about earlier today that some doctors have that. Yeah. Uh, just quickly, this is coming from a woman that is so violently opposed to tattoos and any kind of body <laughs> piercings. You, you cannot imagine. <laughs> So, I, I can imagine the, ty the, 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 the discussions of typography of D and R that could go into tattoos. But. <laughs> so there, there is a uh, website called Medscape, and it's a, it's a very popular medical... Uh, Medscape? Medscape, mm -hmm. uh, that has a, a, a lot of medical information on it. And there is a section in it that is physicians only, and there are discussion boards that only physicians participate in. And there was a thread that was started um, this last year. And it had a picture of Dr. Ed Friedlander. This is a real person. And just from the neck down. And he's wearing his lab coat. And you can read his name right on the lab coat. And he's pulling his shirt open. And, it's, and he has tattooed no CPR on his chest. And the question asked in the thread was, would you do CPR on this person if they went down in front of you? And so the audience is only physicians. And there were, I don't know, a small number, 30 or 40 people that responded to the poll. And 50% said they would ignore the tattoo and the reasons were just astonishing. Um, CPR were the initials of his ex-wife <laughs> <laughs> that he had tattooed because he, you know, or he, he made that decision, but he hasn't had a chance to get it erased yet. <laughs> and, and I mean, the things that were contrived were unbelievable. But half of them would ignore it. If it's a physician, and you can't say a physician doesn't, they don't understand the implications of CPR or not doing CPR. So that's the, the setting. So even with physicians, a knowledgeable person making that choice, they would ignore it. And that. So, so maybe it's not kill the story. lawyers, it's kill the physicians. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I want to re respond to that uh, for, for a second and just respond to the discussion earlier when all you were up for the radio lab. 
um, and, and the doctors are the uh, natives in the system, so they know what's going on, so they don't want to die in the hospital. You know, I, actually, I've been collecting essays, I'm not sure why, but <laughs> for a number of years about doctors who say that, absolutely, I don't want to be hospital, but then they have written personal essays in the narrative section in Health Affairs, which is the leading health policy academic journal in this country, saying, I, of course, wouldn't want to be hospital myself, but I have to tell you what happened when my 97-year-old demented mother, <laughs> who's been on dialysis and has four other chronic conditions, went into cardiac arrest, I did everything I could to save her. And there's a number of physicians who are now writing about this, their own contradiction. And they feel that the impulse to try and save another life or to try to do something to prolong the life of someone you care about and love is so fraught with all kinds of guilt and everything else. And it's, it's fraught also, as I mentioned before, with this problem of the ethical offloading. It's, we don't have paternalism in, in medicine anymore. It's we, the pendulum has swung from the period of the 50s, 60s, where doctors knew best. Patients were much less educated than they are now about health affairs. There was no internet. You couldn't Google you know, a rare disease or anything else. And the doctor made the decision. And of course, death was never spoken at all. And we've swung from that to the health consumer movement and all of this and, and autonomy being the primary value and taking control of your life and your illness situation and having to be responsible for your own care, self-care and that of your family, so that there's this huge ethical burden on patients and families to try and figure it out. And the doctors, in many times, just say, here are your options, now you go decide. And because there are so many options from the most aggressive care to, to comfort care, people are really, really confused. It's, it's, it's very hard to work its way out, and I think we need um, better, better language, as you were saying earlier, from health professionals uh, uh, about how to, how to walk through the minefield. And I think that's one of the reasons that doctors themselves have so much trouble in saying no to um, uh, uh, keeping very elderly, frail family members um, having their lives prolonged. Mm -hmm. Let's see over here. Right there, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, my name is Danielle. I used to work in the art and music world, and I knew Ren from way back. And now I teach in art and medicine at Columbia, so I offer myself as the perfect bridge between Mike, the artist, and, and the uh, physicians who we've heard from today. And I want to thank you for a great day. And one of the um, th themes that keeps coming up, and we keep asking ourselves this question of where does choice reside? You know, is it, is it in the person who's able to successfully write an advanced directive? Is it a choice you make as a, a proxy on behalf of a family member? Is it a, a doctor or nurse um, who's able to advocate on a patient's behalf to make choices for them? Or are we all just, you know, uh, pinballs in the great um, system that we have absolutely no control over, this kind of um, matrix vision, uh, you know, Foucauldian way of looking at it where we really have very little choice whatsoever. And um, I liked that, I liked that vision, Mike, that you, that you pointed to us, and it seemed true because I, in, contra in contrast to this notion that we get the death that we deserve, um, last week I went out to see my 98-year-old grandfather who, I like to say that he puts the pep back in dyspeptic, he's the most ornery, <laughs> Um, let's, you know, like, there's this notion that you have a true age, you know, when you turn 40 and you feel like, oh, well, I was always really 40 and now I'm 40. So he was always 98, <laughs> even when he was 30. So I went out to see him and I usually have a bike out there, even though he lives all the way in Bayside, because it's so unpleasant to actually talk to him that I get there and I'm really tired and I look forward to going to this diner that's in a strip mall near his house and I get a, you know, corned beef sandwich. And, and I went out to see him and usually all he talks about is, is taxes. And um, <laughs> this time he didn't even get to ask me about, you know, what, what kind of for schedule thing do I file with my taxes uh, because when I was there he died. And it was by all accounts, this is the question you're asking about, you know, a good death. It was the best death uh, you could possibly ask for. He was surrounded by me, my crazy uncle, who's a messianic Jew, and my and his partner, who's maybe his girlfriend or maybe not, and he died. And it was very natural. There wasn't anything sad about it, but he didn't deserve it by any means <laughs> whatsoever. Damn. I, that's a terrible thing to say. He's my flesh and blood, you know. But so then I came home and 
It was the first death I had ever witnessed. I'm not a physician, even though I teach narrative medicine. And uh, the next day, a mere 18 hours after this event, I'm in my apartment. I have my family over for brunch. There's a knock at the door, and it's the building people coming. They want to know if I've seen my elderly neighbor uh, who had to have been at least 80. She's a sweet old French lady. I hadn't seen her. They had to crawl over my balcony to get into her apartment, and it turned out, and this is horrible, I'm sorry to add to the macabre element of the day, but she had died, <laughs> she had, I'm sorry, she had died three days before, and so she died alone, and she, she didn't deserve to die alone. She had a very loving family, and she was the sweetest person you could ever meet, and it was just horrible, horrible, horrific, because, I mean, it turned into this whole spectacle, you know, the smell was terrible. So anyway, I just offer that up as a, as a, mm. As an, as a, oh, so, so what, some what, kind of cautionary tale. I'm a cautionary sure. tale, but just just to wrap up, I didn't know what to do with these two events. I didn't know how to create a narrative about what had happened or to extract any meaning from it. So of course, I posted on Facebook that the two things had happened, and hoping to find some crowdsourced meaning from it. And uh, and I just said that the two things had happened, and then I said, "What the hell is happening?" Because I had <laughs> never really dealt with death before, and these two things happened within the space wow. of you know 18 hours. And um, my aunt posted, and she said, well, life, baby, life is happening. <laughs> and I thought, well, all right, that's, that's, that's as much meaning as I can, as I can, life, as I can baby. unpack from life, this. Life, baby, life so. is happening. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, your story reminds me, let's see, let's, let's go over to over here next. Uh, yeah, but, but while it's going over there, yeah. Uh, but while it's going over there, uh, I had a junior high school biology teacher whose name is Mr. Goebbels, actually, and his favorite thing was to get us all riled up because he would describe these weird tropical diseases you could get, and you would die, and the whole class together would go with him. A miserable, horrible, suffering <laughs> death. And, so, and then, you know, the, the worm goes inside your ear and comes out your nose and goes into your eye, and you die a miserable, <laughs> horrible, suffering death. And several years later, we heard that he died a miserable, horrible, suffering death, and we were all so happy for him. <laughs> I've been a healthcare professional for nearly 40 years, and to establish my cred, not to sound like I'm bragging, I've been the executive director of a hospice, and I also now do a lot of public speaking on health and fitness. I speak a lot of, uh, to a lot of seniors. I'm on the Speakers Bureau for the Alzheimer's Association. And uh, one helpful thing I would give to everyone, if you have not had the discussion with uh, any of your family members, and let me caution you to say that it's not those of us in this room wanting to have the discussion with our parents who are still living. And by the way, no one in my family has made it out of their 70s. <laughs> but I just want to say, say <laughs> I just want to say that not only should you think to have this discussion with your elderly, dare I say that word, parents, I also want to encourage those of you with kids to have that discussion with your own children. If having that discussion is difficult, there is something called the five wishes, which you can Google. Um, I've written about it on, my, on a blog. I write uh, a healthcare blog. Google it, and it's a very good jumping off point for you to begin the discussion if talking about end of life issues is something that you find difficult or that you know your children will find difficult with you. Kids, I want to talk to you about what I want. Oh, Ma, don't talk about when you're dying. You'll live forever. Um, as far as a good death goes, my goal is to uh, compress. I'm living my life in a way to compress my years of disability. I talk to seniors about this all the time, and I do hope to one day just drop dead. Uh, and which is, you know, the we used to say in the hospice game, protracted illness is very bad for the patient, very good for the family. And sudden death is very good for the patient and very bad for the family. Mm -hmm. So just plan ahead and make sure that the people that you love know what you want. And if you're lucky, you will get what you want in terms of your health care issues if those are... Uh, if your desires for what you want at that time, and if you're lucky, you will have those wishes met for you. 
Well, listen, why don't we take one one more? Do you want to be the last one? You, you, no, now she's upset. Well, we're, we're, we're gonna let's take let's take. Well, we we will vote whether to do one more after her. We'll see. I, I need to take one thing. Okay, we'll, we'll wait for okay. um, I have a telephone that is uh, protected. If, if somebody picks it up, they can't get into it unless they have my code. But it does have a little corner on it that says "in emergency call," and it's supposed to have my ICE um, information hold, and so hold on. Hold it closer to your mouth. Yep. Just my the ICE information. So somebody who picks up my phone should be able to find out, you know, who who to call to take care of me. Would it be possible to have my advance directives there as well? Who who would know? Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Is something you want to say, something? Um, something that touches upon many of the themes uh, brought up today um, came up actually the day after uh, Ren and I met with Art Kaplan and we talked about what is a good death, how our culture is not prepared to talk about dying and why that is and who are, and Art mentioned also who are our heroes. The very next morning I spoke with a dear friend I've known since I'm 11. She told me she had just spent two days with her aunt typing out a letter she had written by hand and this is the letter. It was written to our congressman about something, but it, it's called A Long Goodbye, Carl Christensen, 1935 to 2012. Losing the person, it's, well, you'll see why it's apropos. Um, losing the person you love is always hard, but losing him for 12 long years is even harder. Carl was my hero even before his heart attack. Our life together hasn't always been easy, but at the end of the day, I was always glad he was my husband and I got to go home with him. When he had his heart attack in 2000, we hadn't even been married one year. We spent our first anniversary in cardiac intensive care. After he came home from the hospital, our lives were changed forever. Some months were good, then it became that only some weeks were good. Finally, we looked forward to good days. I kept working as he tried out different jobs, but he had lost 70% of his heart's function, and everything was hard for him. In the last years of his life, he returned to his first calling, the church, where he was a minister. The last year was very hard. He had started dialysis three years earlier and it wasn't working anymore. Every week I would leave to go to work in New York, they lived in Connecticut, and many um, not knowing what would happen to him while I was gone. We both lived in fear. Um, after many stays in the hospital and going in and out of rehabs, he told me that he was tired and couldn't go on anymore. He wanted to go off the dialysis, which he had to endure every night for nine and a half hours. We both knew what that meant. He would die within one week. <coughs> he asked me to take him home to our wonderful, calm bedroom so he could die there. We told our family and friends of his decision, and it was an opening for all of us. There isn't anything that Carl and I left unsaid. His friends came to say goodbye, completely stunned by his decision to choose death, but privileged to be a part of his passing. We all shared tears and hugs and spoke of things most people never speak of. Death is a subject we all avoid, but here we all were saying goodbye to my sweet husband, knowing that he would be gone in a few days. He went off all his medication, and for a short while he felt wonderful, but he slowly got weaker, and within the week he was gone. I stayed with him every night, and every night, even the last one, we said, I love you and good night. He died at around 2 a.m. one morning, and I woke up and knew he was gone. His daughters were with me. I kissed him and said a final goodbye, and the girls and I felt that he had been released. If there is a beautiful way to die, his was a beautiful death. He was calm, knew what he was doing, and got to say what he wanted to the people he loved. His gift to us is that we were also able to tell him what he meant to us. That's a gift that not many people get. We all fear death, but when you see someone face it like Carl did, it is so moving and life-changing and life-enhancing. I have been mourning Carl, I've been mourning for Carl for 12 years. Our life during those years ran from miraculous to despairing. We talked about everything that we deemed important. We told each other how much we loved each other every day. He knew that I was always there for him, and I knew that he was there for me as long as he could be. When he told me he was done, I believed him. Weighing the importance of time versus quality of life became critical. He did not want to dwindle away. It wasn't his style. He gave me the gift of the rest of my life without fear, his final gift to me. He will always be my hero. That is from Paula Perlini. And um, there's a coda to that, uh, is that when I, I met with her and asked her how the decision was met, she talked about 
I kid you not, when the doctor made, uh, sorry, when he had made his decision and he called his doctor to tell him that 12 years, you know, of the living with this illness, dialysis, they were all close. Like, they, their best friend was the nurse. Uh, I mean, literally, she was the closest thing, um, the person they had for comfort and friendship and support, not to mention the medical attention. The doctor said, the doctor was upset that this choice was being made because he was going on vacation and didn't want to have his patient die before going on vacation. And the, um, meanwhile, the nurse whom they called to share the news with, she was, I forget exact words, but something that uh, she was happy for them, relieved and felt, you know, asked, basically asked to be there. She wanted to be there. I mean, she almost wouldn't take no for an answer and they wanted her to be there and she was. And, you know, so that's another test testament to the nurses and their critical role in all of this care. And um, the main thing I wanted to say is talking about the, the courage and grace that they have with how they faced it and how it's an opening and a gift. And those are not terms you hear often in this discussion. And I just thought that was a beautiful way. And I also wanted to acknowledge in terms of um, it's not a death by any means, uh, but it is an opening and a gift that I'd like to acknowledge that um, Lawrence Weschler is, uh, this is his last program uh, after 12 years directing the New York Institute for the humanities at New York University, um, which has been an incredible journey. He will still continue to be a fellow, be part of the life of the Institute and its programs, but I just also want to acknowledge that, um, acknowledge the, the great gift that he has given to the Institute and to the public. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Uh, okay, well, uh, I guess we should wrap it up. Uh, as I, uh, from, from this conversation, uh, from this whole conversation with all of you, uh, two, two things come out to my mind. It's life, baby, it's life. Uh, but they all think that the very first thing at the very beginning, the just be with her, that, that, uh, That, I mean, if you t just take that slowly, just be with her. And the quality of what it is to be with people, to be being with them, and, and how that is completely different from all the technology and so forth. That, that's exactly what the medical machine can't do. The medical machine, the t technology, the thumping, they can't be with you, but we can be with each other and in a less exalted form, I would just say that it's been uh, my honor and my delight and my <coughs> complete playground to have uh, been with you over the last 12 years. So thank you.